We'll begin here in uh, chapter 1, reading verses 1 through 3. I'll give to you an introduction, some background to develop this, and we'll move into our study. So Ecclesiastes chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 3. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit has a man from all his labor in which he toils under the sun? So we'll begin this series here in the book of Ecclesiastes. And I wanted to teach this particular uh, book because of the timelessness of its message. Also, because it encourages us to discover our highest purpose uh, we're going to see as we go through Ecclesiastes that everything that disregards God is without purpose. Ultimately, it's meaningless. Now, that would include all human efforts. All that which is, he would say, is, is under the sun. The, the term under the sun, if you take notes, you might want to note this. That phrase, under the sun, is used 29 times in the book of Ecclesiastes. Another way to describe life without God, Solomon will point out to us, is, is uh, the word, by using the word vanity. The word vanity is used 37 times to describe a variety of things. Uh, vanity speaks of human labor, wisdom, uh, prestige and pleasure, youthful strength, knowledge. Everything that is done under heaven without God is completely useless, is what he's going to point out, or is simply vanity. Now, I'll, I'll conclude the book in its introduction, because at the end of the book, Solomon con concludes what is the purpose, with what is the purpose of our lives. Uh, see, life's purpose, is going to point out, is found only in a relationship with God. He, he'll say that in chapter 12, verses 13 and 14, where he writes, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this, he says, is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether it's good or whether it's evil. So he concludes by telling us the purpose of the entire book. Everything done under the sun is meaningless without God. Now, a couple basic things. Notice there's no introduction with a name. It doesn't say this is written by Solomon. Um, but the book is attributed to King Solomon. Eight times when you go through this book, uh, he'll infer that he is the one who is the author. <laughs> Notice verse 1. He calls himself the son of David, king of Jerusalem. In uh, verse 16, he speaks of himself as the wisest man of chapter 1. Uh, <laughs> that reminds us of 1 Kings Chapter 4, verses 29 and 30, where it says that God gave Solomon wisdom and very great insight and a breadth of understanding as measureless as the sand on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the people of the East and greater than all the wisdom of Egypt. And so he's referred to as the wisest man. In chapter 2, he speaks of himself as a builder of great works. He speaks of himself as having numerous servants, possessing great herds, having great wealth. In verse 9 of chapter 2, he speaks of himself as greater than all who had lived in Jerusalem. And so for these reasons, Solomon's considered the author of Ecclesiastes. Now, Solomon was son to the king David and Bathsheba. He was the wisest man of his, of his time. Uh, for dates, he was born in 990 B.C. He was crowned the king in 970 B.C., and he died around 930 B.C. Now, in 1 Kings, 1 Kings uh, records that God appeared to Solomon. And I want you to think about this for a moment. And he asked, what shall I give you? So often we ask for the wrong things. And Paul, uh, uh, rather, Solomon's going to point this out as we go through the, uh, the book. We ask for the wrong things, and when we actually receive those things or achieve those things, we know that they're not satisfying. I want this job. I want this car. I want to go to this school. I want to look like this. I want to have this relationship. 
I want to have this fame. I want to have these children. <laughs> sure you do. So, what would you ask for if you were given an unlimited line of credit? What would you ask for? Many years ago, I've shared this before, some will remember this. It's a true illustration, and it comes to mind whenever I see things like that or, or we look at a subject like this. And I used to give my children devotions when they were small. I gave them devotions all their life until they were in their teen years, and they had places they were going and things they were doing. But they grew up with devotions, and we were going through uh, a devotion, and I asked my children, if you had yeah, the ability to ask God for anything, anything at all that you would like, what would you ask for? I started from the oldest to the youngest, and my daughter Corinne, who was probably eight, nine years old at the time, oh, I would ask, and she gave a spiritual answer, and David Aaron gave a spiritual answer, and so did Joseph. And then I went to my Anna, who was the baby, and I said, baby girl, what would you ask for if you could have anything you wanted? What would you, what would you want? She looked at me. She said, gum. And that's kind of, <laughs> that, that's kind of how we are. You know, what would you want? Ask as high as the, it, it, the highest of the high. Ask for whatever you want. And then we ask for things that really don't last. We ask for the things that don't matter. Well, his answer in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 9 was this. Give your servant an understanding heart to judge your people that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? And so God responded in chapter 3 of 1 Kings by saying in verses 10 through 13. Well, it says first that the Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So so God said to him, since you have asked for this and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have asked for the death of your any enemies, but for discernment in administering justice, I'll do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will, nev there will never be anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you've not asked for both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. You didn't ask for things that you could have very well asked for, and they were small things, but you asked for a great thing. You asked for wisdom to care for my people, and for that I'll give you what you didn't ask for as well as other things. Later on in First Kings in chapter 4, verse 34, it says that the men of all nations from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Well, the time of the writing is estimated to be around 935 B.C. It's actually the third of three books that are attributed in Scripture to Solomon. We all know that he wrote the Song of Solomon, the, word, uh, the book of Proverbs, as well as the book of Ecclesiastes. And there are those commentators who like to point out that he would have written Song of Solomon as a younger man. Because when you read Song of Solomon, you see that it's a, it's a love song. It's the song of songs. He wrote, wrote Proverbs as he had grown and had aged and had maturity and experience. And then he would have written Ecclesiastes as he's nearing the end of his lifetime. And that's how it's normally broken up. He wrote Solom Song of Solomon as a young man, Proverbs, middle age, and Ecclesiastes as an older man. And so he begins in verse 1 by saying the words of the preacher, the son of David, the king of Jerusalem. So he identifies himself. Notice this. And again, I'm giving you some basic things so you can um, use those as we study the book. You notice he identifies himself as the preacher, the son of David. He's the king in Jerusalem. He's the preacher, the son of David. The word preacher is a word that's uh, referring to a public speaker, a speaker in an assembly. That's a title. And it's a title that you'll see repeated once again as part of your introduction various times. It's found here. It's found in verse 12 in chapter 7, verse 27, as well as chapter 12, verses 8 through 10. He's the preacher. And so this preacher 
says, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. So he begins this book as a preacher with a very strong statement. Everything that he's encountered in life is categorized as futility. The word vanity simply means futility. He's saying a life not dedicated to God is aimless, it's empty, and it's unsatisfying. And that's why he begins in verse 3 by asking a question, what profit has a man from all his labor in which he toils under the sun? He begins with a question that people relate to. In other words, why do this? What's the use of all of this? Why am I working in the first place? There are a lot of people who, who don't, but those who work, they can't ask, why am I working in the first place? You see, I can find or try to find meaning in my job, but that will always be unsatisfying. I can work so hard that I become very rich and well-known, but at what price? Now, of course, our work can bring a certain level of satisfaction, but at the end of the day, it leaves us empty. It provides, and thank God, it provides for my physical needs. But my job, if I'm driving a, a car, uh, driving a truck, or working in a field, or in a factory, or whatever, my, my job won't meet my spiritual needs. Later on in chapter 6, verse 7, he says it like this, All the labor of a man is for his mouth. And yet the soul is not satisfied. Physical labor, in other words, alone can't produce spiritual abundance. And it certainly doesn't bring us to completeness. Again, life without God is a life lived without meaning. It's simply grasping for straws. In chapter 2, verse 11, he's going to say, I looked on all the works that my hands had done and on the labor in which I had toiled. Indeed, all was vanity grasping for the wind. There was no profit under the sun. Jesus said it like this in, in Mark eight thirty six and 37. He said, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? So a life lived without God and hope for eternity has no purpose. And that's why the Bible teaches us that we should labor for the things that last beyond our lifetime. In John six twenty seven, Jesus said, don't labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. You see, ultimately, all the work, all that we do, all the saving, everything, ultimately, we leave it all behind. Everything. We don't take it with us. You can't. That's an old saying, but it's out of Scripture. You can't take it with you. Now, I've heard of people who have tried to. I remember hearing of a man who was buried in his Ferrari. It was pointed straight down. But um, <laughs> again in chapter 2, and I'm kind of leading into chapter 2 without reading and teaching it yet. But in chapter 2, verse 18, he said this. He said, I hated all my labor in which I had toiled under the sun because I must leave it to the man who will come after me. In chapter 2, verse 21, there is a man whose labor is with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, yet he must leave his heritage to a man who has not labored for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. All the work that you did to build up that business, and you die, and somebody else gets it. Somebody else uses it. Somebody else owns it. I was speaking to a pastor years ago, and he said this to me. And it's interesting because he was speaking in a spiritual sense, and I hope it makes sense in that way to you. But he said, you know, all, all the years of ministry and labor, all the tears, all, all the duress, all that went into my ministry, he said it like that. He said, I'm going to leave in the hands of somebody who will... One day, pastor this church, he goes, I'm going to leave it in the hands of a man who never cried one day over this church. And that's true. That's absolutely true. When the day I step out of this ministry, I will leave it behind in the hands of a man, prayerfully, who will take it further on. But he will not have cried one day for this church. He will not have. You leave everything behind. Never forget that. And Solomon is pointing that out. He points that out. He says, I have to leave everything 
to the one who comes behind me. So the only thing that lasts eternally is what we've done for the Lord. Matthew 6, 19 through 21, Jesus said, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So he's going to point out the answers found in a relationship with God. And we know that it's a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And that's why we prioritize our lives on our relationship. Now he says in verse 4, one generation passes away, another generation comes. But the earth abides forever. So he compares the permanence of the earth with the impermanence of man. From outward appearances alone, nature endures longer than human flesh. Nature seems to be simply an endless cycle of activity. And nature seems to go on forever. In contrast, man is passing through from generation to generation. His lifetime is short compared to the creation that surrounds him. That's the point he's making. In verse 5, he says, the sun also rises, the sun goes down, and hastens to the place where it arose. And so the sun, he's pointing out, is simply in a, an endless repetition. It rises and it sets repeatedly over the years. The wind, verse 6, goes toward the south, turns around to the north. The wind also has cycles, continually moving, never resting. Then he points out again, another natural point. Verse 7, all the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea's not full. To the place from which the rivers come, there they return again. So, though the rivers run into the sea, the sea is never completely full, even if Al Gore says that it is. <laughs> <laughs> Seawater evaporates, it forms clouds, brings rain. It's an endless hydraulic cycle. Compared to nature's cycles, he's saying, man is here today. He's gone tomorrow. His lifespan is short in comparison to the mountains and the seas, to the rivers and the deserts. Job said it like this. He said in Job 14, 1 and 2, a man who is born of woman is a few days full of troubles. He comes forth like a flower and fades away. He flees like a shadow. He does not continue. So compared to the centuries that some things exist, He's pointing out man's lifetime is brief. In Psalm 90, verse 10, Moses said it like this. He said, the days of our lives are 70 years. And if by reason of strength, they're 80 years. Yet their boast is only labor and sorrow. For it is soon cut off and we fly away. So that's supposed to cause us to pause, to consider making the best use of our time. Here's something that you learn as you grow older. Those of you who are gray-haired, silver saints. <laughs> Even if you try to wash away that gray. <laughs> it should cause us to pause and make the best use of our time. Why is that? Because every moment that we have is a moment that will never again be repeated. My uh, grandson, uh, David, um, turned nine. I didn't tell him this because I didn't want to bum him. I, and he, he's very sensitive, so I wouldn't. But I thought, and, and I've done this with so many of my children, grandchildren. They went to bed at the age of eight, but they woke up at the age of nine. And that age of eight will never be repeated. You never return to that age. It passes by. I didn't want to tell him that because he'd cry. <laughs> so I didn't tell him. I just thought it. And I cried. <laughs> you know, some, some parents are, <laughs> listen up. Some parents are saying, oh, I can hardly wait till they go. I can hardly wait till my children are out of the house. Then we'll be free again. You know, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we're free at last. But you know what? As you grow older, you look at your children as they grow older and you begin to wish sometimes that they were young again, just for one day. 
just for one moment. I wouldn't want to go through that again, but that <laughs> moment. It's true. Now, those of you without children or, or maybe even have small children, you, you, you won't relate to this that well. Those of us who have been around for a while and we've had our children, yeah, it, you, you ask yourself, where did the time go? How did it move so quickly? You know, we were so little at one time. And, and, and you can, you, if you have even a small amount of sentimental, um, a sentimental heart, yeah, and I happen to have one, everybody knows that. You look at them and, uh, and you wonder, where did the time go? Where did the little girl go? Where did the young boy go? Where, where, did, where did he go? Sometimes you say, I wish he'd go, but sometimes you'll think, where did he go? And you can look at him, and you can regret some things. You can, you can say, gosh, I wish I'd have known. I wish I'd have thought. Life seems to just creep on. And then one day you realize it flew by. Many years ago, and I'll say this hopefully without um, showing much emotion, it's one of the things that hit me when my children were very small. And I, I was given a lady in our fellowship at the time, we, way back when we were in uh, Ontario High School, meeting there on Sundays, uh, approached me and gave me a handwritten letter. It was not really a letter, it was a poem. And it was called A Poem to My Grown-Up Son. And it's, uh, it's from the perspective of a mother who wrote to her boy. And, and I'm going to read this, and prayerfully I won't get overly weird about it. <laughs> but it touched me then, and I have to tell you, my kids are, are small, smaller than, than they are now. But this is the poem, and, and I'm saying this to parents right now, those of us who are, are parents, and, and for those who are not uh, parents, one day perhaps you'll appreciate this in the way that, that some of us may at this moment. But this mother writes, my hands were busy through the day. I didn't have much time to play the little games you asked me to. There we go. <laughs> I didn't have much time for you. I'd wash your clothes. I'd sew and cook. But when you'd bring your picture book and ask me, please, to share your fun, I'd say a little later, son. I would tuck you in all safe at night, hear your prayers, turn out the light, and tiptoe softly to the door. I wish I'd stayed a minute more. Life is short. The years rush past. The little boy grows up so fast. No longer is he at your side, his precious secrets to confide. No picture books are put away. There are no longer games to play. No good night kiss, no prayers to hear. That belongs to yesteryear. My hands, once busy, now are still. The days are long and hard to fill. I wish I could go back and do the little things you asked me to. We have to be aware that time moves. We have to take every moment that God gives to us and enjoy those moments because once they're past, they never return. In James 4.14, it says, You do not know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. He says in verse 8, All things are full of labor. Man cannot express it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. It's not just that man is working all the time. Nature itself is constantly at labor. It, it is continually restless, going through constant change. He's saying that nature is in constant activity. It is never resting. And man, for all his activities, also constantly in motion and never resting. And he will never really have rest outside of resting in the Lord. Notice how he says in verse 8, The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. In an entire lifetime, we never completely exhaust our ability to see as long as we have vision and to hear as long as we have the ability to do so. Our, our eyes and our ears never register full. There's always something else to see. In every way, sight can be used. There's always something else to hear. And we never stop seeing and we never stop listening. 
No matter what it is that we see, no matter what it is that we hear, we always desire to see and to hear more. And beauty doesn't necessarily fulfill us because we always want to see something different. And again, in verse 8, at no point do we ever stop desiring. And, no longer, and we never really stop longing for the novel. At no point do we desire to cease being able to see and hear. So he says in verse 9, that which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. There's nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which it may be said, see, this is new? It has already been in ancient times before us. Man's desires, his complaints, his pursuits are always basically the same. And as far as something completely new, ultimately, we don't create. We simply innovate. People constantly look for something new and different, but there's no such thing. That's why, again, as a parent, that's why you can take your child, we'll say, to the edge of the Grand Canyon. Don't push them in. Stand at the edge of the Grand Canyon. And they get bored. Okay, you saw it. Let's go. You're standing there holding hands, saying, man, look how amazing. And you got this kid saying, I see more than this, you know, on my iPod. Who needs this? They get bored. And that kind of shows what happens. Um, styles and, and music are, are constantly recycled. It's been said what comes around goes around. So there's nothing really that's completely new is the point that he's making. He, he says in verse 11, there's no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of things that are to come by those who will come after. People don't remember the history. They don't remember what has taken place. They, they're not aware because history is forgotten. It's, it's forgotten in that, that um, never-ending quest for something new and improved. He's saying, you know, you're here today, but you'll be gone tomorrow, and nobody's going to remember you. Nobody will remember your accomplishments, and that's, that's, that's very true. That's, that's true of all human beings, and that's true of, of some of the greatest. People will say things like, uh, Chuck Smith, didn't he use a pastor at church somewhere? I think I've heard of him. As, as accomplished as, as he was in the Lord, as many great things as God used him to do, people forget. You can go into the Calvary Chapel today and you won't see any remembrance of him. The church he pastored for all those years because they come and they go. That's what happens. Billy Graham at one time was the greatest world evangelist known, but you forget about him. That's what happens. That's the whole point he's making is that it's always a, a quest for something different or new. And, and so we're constantly searching for that. We forget. Well, in verse 12, he says, I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. I, I set my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all that is done under, under heaven. This burdensome task God has given to the sons of man by which they may be exercised. Uh, when he speaks of that and he says, I set my heart, the word heart uh, is not speaking of his emotion. It speaks of his intellect. I applied my mind is what he's saying. I determined to search out by wisdom everything that has been done under heaven. I searched out the meaning and the purpose of life here on planet Earth. I, I wanted to understand why men do what they do socially and politically and even privately. I wanted to know these things. He says in verse 13 that this burdensome task has been given to the sons of man. Now... In, it calls it a burdensome task. You see, in the garden, these things were already known. But after the fall, these things became a task. Uh, it, it's something that we actually are trained by. We, we seek out purpose. We seek out meaning. And, and then we find that life is difficult. It's filled with pressure, which helps us to seek the things of the Lord and to grow in him. He goes in verse 14, I've seen all the works that are done under the sun and Indeed, all this vanity, 
grasping for the wind. Uh, I've looked how, uh, how human beings act and, and what drives them, and I see that they're unsatisfied. I see that life on earth is painful, and I see that it can be so terribly painful it can break a person. He's saying human effort and human achievement ultimately has no meaning. Uh, in verse 14, again, I, I've seen all the works that are done under the sun. Indeed, all is vanity. So frustration arises when one attempts to correct the problems of man without God. When we encounter problems and we try to solve them without moral directions, without considering God's help or looking for him in his word, when we try to fix our lives without him, you know, it comes to a place of frustration. What do we do when we, when we try to solve the problems that we might have or that we see other people have. I wrote a few things down. What do we do to solve problems? Well, we, we prescribe puberty blockers for children wanting a gender change without notifying parents. We legalize drugs. We provide clean syringes to junkies. We call various sexual partners lovers, and we classify homosexuality as a normal way of life. We say that AIDS is caused by a virus, not drugs or promiscuous sex. We refer to abortion as a woman's right to choose. We call alcohol or drug dependency a disease. We say men can compete with women in sports. Share, they can share locker rooms and, and bathrooms. We have drag queen story hours for preschoolers. And we provide porn in our schools for our children. That's the answers people will provide for problems when they don't have God. You're seeing that right now. That's what we do. So he's saying human wisdom excludes the spiritual. And because it excludes the spiritual, human wisdom is bankrupt. He says in verse 15, what is crooked cannot be made straight and what is lacking cannot be numbered. What is crooked can't be set in order. What is lacking is something that, is, that cannot be provided, he's saying, by our, our own efforts. Somebody said human wisdom cannot make straight that which is crooked. Human deficiencies cannot be cured through man's vain attempt at solving problems that in their root is spiritual. He says in verse 16, I communed with my heart, saying, Look, I have attained greatness, have gained more wisdom than all who were before me in Jerusalem. My heart has understood great wisdom and knowledge. I have great knowledge, but I didn't apply wisdom to the knowledge that I have. And because of my great knowledge, I've become proud of all that I've known. In 1 Corinthians 8, 1, it says it very simply. It says, knowledge puffs up. So uh, this is what I've discovered with all this wisdom and understanding. If I'm excluding the things that, that are built on God and faith in him, it's just vanity. He says in verse 17, I set my heart to know wisdom, to know madness and folly. I perceived that this is also grasping for the wind. I sought to become wise. I wanted to understand what is madness and what is foolishness. I desired to know why some people are wise and others are crazy fools. I studied them. I watched them. I spoke to them. I the word study, you do study people. You may or may not realize that. I think you do, but perhaps you don't. When, when, and I've said this before, but I'll say it very quickly. You study. When, um, when Peter was saying to husbands that we're to dwell with our wives with understanding, when we are to observe them, he is simply saying that the way that we'll understand our wife is by learning her. Men, men can observe and by behavior can begin to kind of understand and as chauvinistic and as, as politically incorrect as this is, I'll say it anyway, it doesn't matter, right? I'm an old man, you can just say that. Your wife can say something is blue for 40 years, and then one day it turns yellow. I thought I knew you. 
you did then. This is me now. You have to watch them constantly. Husbands do that, by the way, uh, ladies. We may not hear the multitude of your words. <laughs> but we do watch your behavior. And that's how we figure you out. That's how we come to understand you. I could go into this a lot. I won't, but that's just the truth. I, I know my girl, not simply by what she says. I know my girl by what she does. And uh, when we were first married, I, I said something like, you can tell me all day long that you love me. But to me, that's just a word. That's just a word. I'm going to know that you love me by how you treat me. That's how I'm going to know you love me. And the way that I know you love me and the way you treat me is going to be demonstrating love by the respect you have for me. Because that's how men understand love. That's why Paul in Ephesians 5 would say that the wife is to reverence or to respect her husband. Why is that? Because that's how he understands that she loves him. And when she doesn't respect him, when she puts him down in front of people, when she makes him feel stupid, that's her way of saying, I don't love you. That's how men hear it. And all day long, we can argue about the words and what we meant. But men don't worry about the words, ladies. You know that. Those of you who are married probably know that. If you don't, I hope you learn it. Because that's how we, that's how we understand things. That's how the average man understands it's not what you say, it's what you do. And when you say you love, it's how you act. That's how it works, right? And so we can do all that we want. We can apply our knowledge to try and understand different things. We, I tried to understand what human wisdom is. I wanted to understand what craziness is. Uh, I, I want to know what makes people tick. It's like he took a sociology class. I want to see this, a psychology class. I want to learn these things. That's the point he's really making. And then he goes on to say, verse 18, in much wisdom is much grief. And he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. Isn't that interesting? That's, that's absolutely true. Gaining wisdom actually has a result of sorrow and grief. Why is that? And I'll say it quickly because we're going to have communion in a moment. But it's because the more you gain, the more you understand, the more you the more you, you learn of the things of life and, and all, the greater sorrow you can have when people don't care about those things. It, it, that is one of the motivators of every pastor, by the, way, by the way, as they grow in the things of the Lord. And as they grow in the things of the Lord, they want more people to see these things. And that's what they try to do. They try to teach these things to people. And then what happens? The, 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 people, the people, many people don't care. Uh, all of the prayer, all of the study, all of the seeking of the Lord in every variety of ways that is done. And the preparation coming up to say, God has spoken to my heart. I want you to hear these things. And, and it's raining. And people say, oh, it's raining. I'll just stay home. And he's, he's thinking, why didn't I just stay home? I could stay home just like you. I didn't. Why did I come and you didn't? Well, maybe. It's, and they'll say, oh, because you're supposed to be there. You're the pastor. Yeah, that kid who got up, a young man, and his mother says, it's time to get up. Got to get to church. And he says, and I, I'm not going today. She says, no, honey, you need to get up. He says, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to go. I'm not going today. She says, you have to. And he says, I don't have to. Give me, give me a reason why I have to go. She says, honey, it's Sunday. We go to church. And secondly, you're the pastor. You have to go. I made it my aim, Solomon says, to understand these things. And at the end of the time, I just discovered that with more knowledge comes greater grief. The knowledge that ultimately satisfies and will bring peace is the knowledge of God. In Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, let not the mighty man glory in his might, 
nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth, for in these I delight, saith the Lord. Where is true wisdom? Wisdom is found in the knowledge of God. He's beginning to lay that foundation, the foundation that leads to the conclusion when he says, this is the summation of all things. Obey the Lord. Know him, pursue him, because in him is true life. And so we're going to be looking through the book of Ecclesiastes, and we're going to watch a man in pursuit of that which he is revealing to us, what it means to have a relationship with God.